Hi, and welcome to MC Podcast, episode 18. Thanks for joining us today. My co-host in studio is Lynn Crabtree. Lynn, Morning, welcome. Mark. Morning. Everything going okay with you this week? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, good. I think when we talked earlier this week, you were uh, planting some beans, some late beans after some triticale. Yeah, I don't want everybody to know that. They know the date here in July and that uh, and that this old fool was out planting some uh, double crop beans behind uh, some late harvest of triticale. I don't know whether they uh, you know. I don't think you're the only one, though. So I was down at the plant, and um, they were talking that guys are still getting beans uh, treated and planting. All, all over, all over Southern Illinois. So I think that that's a Southern Illinois thing. This you know, year. there's a lot of hydraulic pressure from Mississippi River down in those river bottoms down in there, and that and that water level has just begun to go down, and that ground dry up where they could get into it. And yeah, I know Heston said he treated. I can't remember how many dozen tons of, of soybeans that uh, that he treated down there here in the past in the last week and a half or so. But uh, but yeah, we had our case. We had some. Uh, we had some really late triticale that we harvested. It was pretty full season stuff. And so it was about a week and a half, two weeks after wheat harvest. So we were pushed late. And then uh, we had a couple of showers that, that really kind of, um, I mean, they're, they're welcome showers. Um, don't get me wrong. Right. But uh, we were tracking ground a little bit. We had to quit combining. And and uh, so we just finished up combining. We bailed up uh, a few hundred bales of straw. And we picked that up. And then... Um, and then, uh, yeah, I got out there with my two-year-old grandson in my buddy seat, and uh, we were we were planting beans. So, I'll, so I'll have to ask the question again, just so we get it on record this time. Did Sawyer keep the rows straight? Sawyer didn't do bad. Okay. You know? so okay. Did, it's not like that Pop Pop doesn't need to continue to, you know, to encourage, teach, and train the boy. You right. know, I mean, uh, he's still new at this. He's still two. Um, but, uh, you know, he didn't He didn't do bad. He didn't do bad. Yeah. Well, good. Well, good. Well, I, you know, I mean, it's one of those things. You, you say you need to continue to, to train and show him the ways because he's just two. My dad is in this week. And, um, and so I'm, I'm 41 and apparently he still feels the same way about me that he needs to train and teach and do some of those oh, things. That's for, good. Yeah. You that's know, good. which is probably true. Right. You know I mean? Yeah. Which is, which is probably true, but, uh, you so, want me to get together with him and give him no, a little helpful no, hints? No, or? I, I would appreciate if that would not happen. Okay. You know what I mean? I was like, I think that would just be safe for everybody. You'd rather I stay busy? Is that <laughs> yeah, the deal? Yeah. You, yeah. Need, you got some beans to plant? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Hey, um, got some interesting information over the last couple of weeks and um and we'll just we'll give credit where credit is due sure um hordes dairyman uh sends out a continuing marketing survey I, as far as i can tell it looks like uh yeah it, it looks like they do it every every two years and then and then send it out so they surveyed 2016 and then and then they turn it out in 2017 i i assume that they'll do the same thing in in 18 and turn it out in 19 just from the way that it looks and so just some really good information there some things that just really kind of popped and 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 were really good mainly about obviously uh about the dairy market and 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 how and how that's that's rolling over not only with so they they do this with a lot of their respondents or their their sub subscribers and they respond to the survey but then they also throw some stuff in there from USDA and some really really good information and some things that that I think that 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 are good to look at and the things that are good to notice and and some of those things and so one one of the things that I thought was really pretty interesting is that in 2016 the number of cows in the US was up so we had we had more we had more milk cows uh, in in the US this year we we grew uh, the grew the number of cows, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but it seemed like the number of dairies were down. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and so obviously that means we're we're shifting in the marketplace there a little bit, and, you know. And as a as a businessman, how do you how do you look at those things, Lynn? And 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 kind of think, okay, what what does this what how do, how do you position the business as according to some of this information? You know, I mean, how how does a business guy look at that? You know. Um uh, good question, and there's about three or four different ways that we we we, sh we could probably expand upon this, and and I don't know that you and I totally agree on that, sure. and and I suppose that's fine. We don't have to agree on everything, uh, but it it's an, it's been a it, it's kind of a radical change from one year to the next, or, the, or the, this survey is every two years, yeah. and so from uh, every two year period, so the even number of years here are the years that they were that they are using here. Uh, they go back this this particular survey goes back to. 
tw- brings data in from 2006, 2006, 2006, up to 2016 right. every two years. And so there's been a, a pretty drastic change from 2014 to 2016. But if you follow, there's some real, there's some trends here. Right. You know, it's right. not just that all of a sudden now we've got more cows on fewer farms. That's a trend that's been taking place over some time. And and so I think you've got to begin to look at, I mean, in, in business like we are, and, and, you know, that's kind of the bent that you brought right. the question exactly. from. Exactly. Who who are we who are we marketing to mm-hmm. who are we selling to mm-hmm. and uh, you know there's there's some there's some information in here that that uh, kind of gives some some indication there I, I just want to say that you know right up front you said let's give credit where credit's due you and I aren't market analysts right but we right. like to we like to voice opinions yes. you know you you and I are not the shy types that, right you know, the hold back. And so somebody wants to know what we think, we pretty well let them know it, you know. And sometimes when we, when they even, really even don't, when they want, don't want it, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, there's a, you and I've got some, some opinions about, you know, obviously the, the large farms have been a growing segment and, and the percent of cow numbers out there in the hands of large farms are much greater than it was back when I was a dairy nutritionist. Okay. Back in the day before uh, I even, Paul and I even bought Master's Choice and we were, we were consulting with dairy farms. The landscapes changed tremendously and folks have had to be able to adapt to that or they were or they needed to get out of the business. Right. Right. And so a lot of folks obviously did get out of the business. Um, one interesting fact that we could kind of draw into right now some, for, from some data that came out of here is if you look at the average age of the, the dairy respondents in this survey right. alone, right. Um, the, the percentage of operators... Uh, 55 and older were over 50 percent of the respondents. Yes. So I mean, it's it, the dairy industry isn't much different than than any other segment of agriculture. The the average age of the the owner decision maker is, is getting up there pretty good. And do you, do you think that's because it's harder for guys to to start in, or do you think that it's the guys are just they just don't want to do it? I mean, you know, I mean, is it is it the guy who is it the son and and the daughter who goes off to college and like. Look, I, I don't. I don't want to get up every morning and milk. I don't want to have to deal with this. Or, or is it the fact that there's just not enough money out there in it, and and there's just no way for them to be to come back to the farm? You either got to get up and get it, or stay at home. Okay. You know, there's a lot of different. There's a lot of ways. You know, particularly with hillbilly slang here in Southern yeah. Illinois, that I could say that. But you either got to get it, or or stay at home. Right. And and so. There is, in my opinion, Mark, and I don't know how you feel about this. There is a there is a point where, you know, you can you can almost hobby farm anything, including yeah. dairy. Yeah. But you're going to need some some supplemental income right. off of the farm. You know, we've got we've got folks that sell seed right. for us. You know that that dairy. Mm-hmm. You know, and and they find they find time in their day. I don't know how they do it, but they find time in their day to get out and they sell. They sell a lot of seed, and and so they're supplementing that income, and they can get by with a smaller herd size. But there's a there's a there's a group in the middle there, someplace, and and we probably would argue about it. But there's a group in the middle where there's where there's not enough cows, and 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 and, and then there's too many cows, and that's a hard group that's taken all of their income off of the farm to sustain themselves, and that's that's been the saddest part of all of this as a dairy. Th- as this dairy industry, as agriculture is unfolding, and these numbers show themselves, man, uh, some of my some of my best friends, you know, in in business growing up, and that I love to spend time on the farm and work with them on a consulting basis, were those folks that were under five hundred cows, and yeah. you know, and and and, and over fifty or hundred. Well, it's it's the same way with it's the same way with farming. My my best friend, he. He uh, he has the family farm. I think it's about 200 acres uh, of tillable land, and uh, you know he has an outside job and he rents a few acres. But if he had to just make a living off of, I think it's seven, eight hundred acres that he farms. If he had to make a living off that, I'm not sure that he could. Yeah, you know, and that's just that's the row crop guy, and I think it's the same for the dairy guy. Yeah, <clears throat> I think you're going to have that that smaller herd that's that's maybe a hundred cows and smaller that's maybe even got a specialty niche. Maybe it's a, a locally sourced milk or a cheese that they're making or they're, you know, they're bottling their own stuff or, or you know, they're marketing it there. Maybe they've got a creamery and ice cream and and, and that kind of guy I think is the one who is going to 
going to be able to who's who's going to be able to sustain somebody who's going to do that. So I, I I feel and and I'm I'm opinionated and I you know and I'm not always right, but I'm more often right than I'm wrong. Just ask my wife, right? And um, yeah, this is one of those places you nod and say, yeah, that that makes sense. Um, I'm thinking how I can work in. I could talk to to Mandy at the same time I'm talking to your dad. I, I mean, <laughs> trying to put all that together. Yeah, Please yeah. don't. Okay. <laughs> but but I so I really think that you know we we've seen we've seen a lot of things in agriculture here. We've seen we've seen the the organic trend, and we're starting to see some non GMO trends and some of those things. I really think what a guy's looking for and what people are looking for these days are not necessarily um, something that's labeled, but they they just want to know something more about their food. And so I think what we're going to see is a shift in agriculture for some of those people to want to to do like more locally sourced. And so a dairy that could maybe even snap into that market, that specialty locally sourced kind of thing, that hundred cow, maybe even fifty cow dairy, and 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 kind of kind of um, capture some of that. I think they're going to survive. I think that guy who is two hundred fifty cows to a thousand cows is going to have a really hard time surviving. I I I have to agree. I think what's happened is is when son or daughter has gone off to college, they come back and they and they have they are either going. Dad, let's take the dairy to the next level so that we can, you know, so that yep. we can econ- we can we can make the co- correct kind of economically sized unit that's going to be able to be efficient and profitable or they're going to come back and they're going to they're going to decide that they're going to be taking a job someplace in the industry outside of the dairy. Okay. And in which case I think that that really begins to shape what happens to that dairy yeah. farm? Dad plays out the farm until he's at a point where where he's not willing to put up with it. It's too much for too little, and and uh, and and he and he lets the farm go. And 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 son and daughter are, are in town, you know, with with a job, uh, or or son or daughter comes back home and says, let's 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 push this thing. Yep. And now all of a sudden, you know, we've got a we've got a we've got a larger farm. So I mean, the larger farms, I think, ha- have have been in a position that they have to grow. I'm just really sad that that that's that that's happened. I think it's it's changed so many lifestyle for so many people. Yep. You know, uh, it, it's really. Um, such a agriculture, and you you know that as well as I. You farm boy. I've been a farm boy yep. all my life. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful life, a great place to raise Absolutely. children uh, and and grandchildren. Man, mm-hmm. boy, that mm-hmm. wow is this awesome. Well, I'm not that old yet. Kids, woo. Uh, I, I I love this, but yeah, yeah. No, so I I think you're right, and and I think that that kid coming back to the farm probably has two different mindsets. Number one is. I, I don't want to do this because I see how what hard work this is, you know, and and we we know that there's a generation of snowflakes out there. I mean, yeah. that's that's really that's really what it is. And then and then we have those those guys that come back. They really do want to make it work, but but the economics aren't there, you know. I mean, I'm I don't, I I think it would be hard to expand a dairy right now unless you are a great manager, unless unless things are going going really good, you know. Fifteen dollar milk, sixteen dollar milk. It's hard to see how we how we um, how how we have enough capital to be able to expand a dairy right now. You look at some of those USDA numbers. I think it's back as as far back as uh, um, well. You got to go back over ten years before you had an average milk price as low as what we had here in twenty sixteen. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so that's I mean that's pretty incredible. Thirty three, thirty five percent lower milk price. Um, average in 2016 than it was in 2014. I mean, tell me that's not a, you know, that's not an adjustment, you know, that folks have got to, that, that folks have to make. And so, uh, uh, been a, been a, been a difficult road and, and, um, and, and tough, tough got to survive, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there were, there were some, there were some good things that, that out, out of this, uh, out of this market survey, milk production per cow was up. Milk production per cow was up in 2016, almost 400 pounds per cow. Okay, um, almost 400 pounds per cow. I think the average was about uh, 22,000 pounds, 20, 22,000, 22, seven, something like seven, that. something like that. So, so milk production was up. So we're inching kind of closer to that 30,000 pound kind of average, right? I mean, that's that's always been the goal for for a while. All right. And so, in in your opinion, what is it going to take? I mean, we're, it looks like we're making small increments there. 
average average is you know twenty two thousand seven hundred now. What's it going to take for a guy who is sitting at that average? What's it going to take for him to get to thirty thousand pounds? You you came into my office here the other day and you were telling me about a survey that. Uh, that uh, took place at, at University of Wisconsin. Was that Randy Shaver maybe yeah, that you were Sha- visiting Shaver, with? Or? Yeah, I was reading a report on some, on some stuff that Shaver had, had kind of put together. Well, that to me was pretty much spot on. If you, if, to, to answer your question, the results that, that they got back, well, they were saying that the one thing that the 30,000-pound that the herds that exist out there now have in common is that they've got a, a passion for high-quality forage. Yeah, high-quality high forage in, in lower, um, lower grain inputs, in fact, is what it was kind of saying. Yeah. It was really, it was really interesting. So, so high-quality forages, so would you, I mean, so you agree with that? You think that oh, that's... Yeah. You think that that's where it's at? No, no question about it. I, I really do. Uh, as a as a as a dairy consultant, I always visited the farms and those that were successful. And we kind of it was kind of a pattern. There was, in all probability, it was two brothers, okay. you know, yeah. or, or or brother and sister, or uh, a pair of cousins, or or whatever. But there was a there was a pair on the farm, and one of them specialty was 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 cow. Uh, and 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 uh, husbandry, animal husbandry, mm-hmm. taking care of the cows, milking the cows, uh, and and seeing to it that the management was at a high level. And the other guy, that the other brother, his thing was 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 farming, was row crop, and he wanted to raise the crops. and And so he was he was focused on efficiently uh, bringing in high quality forage. <laughs> a lot of the time, you never the, the one guy wasn't both. Right. You know, right. he didn't have the skills to be. Uh, the cow care comfort guy that he needed to be, uh, so I'm, I'm and the stop, crop guy. So I'm not going to say they didn't have the skills. Maybe he didn't have the passion. Oh, I don't know, man. I I think that I think some of these guys were absolutely <laughs> lost when it come to when it come to farming, you know. And and uh, and and then the other guy, if he was a, if he was a great cow guy, he brought in great uh, great forages. If he also had to milk the cows, I think you know. Uh, you know that I don't know why the, the the dumb girl doesn't give more milk. You right, know, right, right, right. Uh, so I, I don't know. Maybe we maybe we can agree to disagree there. Okay. So no, that that, that <laughs> no, that makes sense. So so you you have these two you have these two siblings or partners or whatever it is, and and one guy is is the cow guy pays attention to the cows. The other guy likes likes to smell dirt. The other guy likes to smell cows. For for lack of better terms, Large, larger dairy farm today, you better have you better have a good ag- agronomist, yes. a good farm manager. You know the guy out there in the field, and you better have a a good uh, cow herd manager. Yep. A, a good and, and 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 those guys need to be talking. You know? Oh boy, and, and, yeah. And that is one thing that I've seen um, with some of the more progressive, uh, higher producing, better managed dairies is that. When 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 I go in to talk to the dairy about uh, high quality corn silage, um, you know they that the nutritionist you the nutritionist or the or the herd guy he usually calls me in to kind of to kind of make the for lack of better terms the pitch to to the to the ag- agronomic guy or the, the agronomy bridge, guy the yeah, bridge and to kind kind of build that bridge there and so. And say, look, we need higher quality forages. We need as much of the high quality forages as we can get, but we need higher quality forages to be able to make to make better production. Well, let, let's be perfectly honest here. We have created that chasm between the two entities. You know, the yep. two farm entities, yep. the, the 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 crop guy and the and the herd guy. We've created that chasm because we've come out with all these great nutritionally enhanced products that have got got great milk per ton averages but there's no yield there's no yield there so and so we, we've put the pressure on the crop guy we say hey yeah go out there and, and grow this you know bmr forage or let's go out there and grow this you know nutritionally enhanced high sugar grass forage or whatever it is and they yield about half or, or two-thirds of what you know he's used to and he doesn't have the acres right you know as the, right. as the farm's growing he's got to manage his acres and you know and, and what do you do when you get to the when you when you're not to the end of the season that you're in but you're at the end of the forage the inventory forages. yeah you know and now you all of a sudden you got to be mm-hmm. buying that in and boy oh boy is that going to get expensive and, it, it, and so there but there has to be there has to be a way to um um there, ha, there has to be a way to to for lack of better terms bridge that gap to where um you know, to where that to where that agronomy guy is not just looking at the the amount of material he's getting off an acre, but but he's got to be looking at okay, how how do I how do I make this more more high quality, 
And, and I think sometimes there there's a there's a butting of heads there. It's like, do you, do you want enough feed or do you want high quality feed? Mm-hmm. And and it doesn't have to be an either or. You know, and I, and I think that sometimes we think it's this this either or, but there's got to. So the most successful farms that I've seen is where the herd guy, the nutritionist, and the agronomist all sit together and say, "Let's make a plan. Let's figure out what we need. Let's figure out how we're going to get from enough feed. You know, this is the acres that we have. This is how we're going to get enough feed, and these are the things that we're going to do to try to improve the quality of that." I don't know how you feel about this, but I'll, but I'll give you my 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 impression, my take. Okay. Okay. I think that what we have to do is I think we have to focus on yield. Now okay. that's coming from the guy whose whose mouth just said that high quality forage yeah, is the way to success. And, and part of me just died when you said that. I I'll be honest. I understand. I, okay. I completely understand. Part part of me died. We've we've got to we've got to be able to. We've got to be able to yield. We've got to be able to bring those kind of plants. But there's so many things that we can do that we don't do right. to be able to encourage higher quality feed, you know, out of the out of those high yielding plants that we that we that we focus on. We have in our R and D always focused on yield and agronomics, and then you come along and you say, yes, this is nutritionally enhanced, or no, it isn't. Right. And we've, we've thrown away a lot of good materials that were agricultural, that were agron- agronomically right. sound and solid and would yield, but they don't have that edge that's going to give us a little more milk per ton. And there's management, Mark, that we can use to yes. help raise those the, the, the quality of, of those of there, those there uh, high yielding uh, um, hybrids, it there doesn't is. have to be, um, a, you know, s- yield yield loss y- to suffer yield to loss, do that. You're I'm right. sorry. There, yeah, there doesn't there doesn't have to be yield loss to do that, and 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 so um, you know, and part of that is going to be management. You know, part part of that is 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 management. You know, it's it's it is genetics. You know, it's 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 get putting the right genetics on the right piece of ground, and then managing those genetics correctly. And so I think a lot of times we just we, we kind of get in a rut and we and we do this we do the thing same thing over and over and and we just we get used to things and we like that and we get comfortable and I, I and and maybe I'm wrong here but it seems like in agriculture it's it's more so that way in agriculture than than any other way you know this is the way this is the way I want to do it this is how I want to do it this is when I want to do it and it just fits my system and it makes me feel comfortable and and um and and, and so I think sometimes we've got to step outside of that and say okay what are we what are we going to do and and maybe part of it is is the dairy sitting down and saying these are my goals Maybe it's the herd guy sitting down and saying, "These are the goals that I want to reach." You know, I want to reach. Um, uh, you know, I, I want I want to reach twenty five or twenty five thousand pounds next year per cow. You know, I'm at twenty three this year. I want to reach twenty five. And maybe it's sitting down with the uh, the uh, agronomy guy or the farming guy side of the farm and saying, "Can we increase the milk per ton? Can we can we increase the milk per ton? The quality in in we can debate back and forth on 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 that, but but let's just use milk per ton as kind of the the measure of quality. Can I improve milk per ton uh, on my on my uh, on my forages? Can can I do that? And can I can I do it? Can I do it? You know, another you know, f- I don't know. You know, is it fifty? Is it a hundred? Is it is it two hundred? Uh, Pounds of milk per ton. I mean, where 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 is that threshold at that that makes it it makes it important? But can can I do that? Right. I, I think that I think we're talking about let's let's continue to talk about milk per ton here because it because it's the industry number that we're right. using. Right. But I think that I think that you've gone way past milk per ton. Milk per ton was a formula that was used from evaluations that we knew in two thousand and six. Six. This is ten years later, yep. and and I know that you use many more lab analysis to be able to determine the right. value of a silage or or a or a or a hay or haylage okay. than what we had in two thousand and six, and and that's credible. But we got to have something that we use as a as a as a as a standard. And sure. so milk yeah. per ton is fine, it's and you're talking milk per, milk per ton, right? But get this, get this, and and you know if if you don't get anything else, get this. Okay. If the average milk per ton of corn silage that the labs are are, are are that are being turned into labs today is thirty two hundred pounds of milk per ton. Okay, and if that number was was valid, and it's 
you know, it was it's it's a it's a it's an arbitrary number for sure, but it's it's a decent number it's, to it's use for indicator. conversation. It's an in, in, but it's an indicator. Yeah, it's a, it's an indicator. It is. So if you could take that thirty two hundred pounds of milk per ton, and you could add fifty pounds to that, if if through your you know your selection of genetics or or your management critique, if you could add fifty pounds of milk per ton, and instead of having average milk per ton silage of thirty two hundred, yeah. you had thirty two hundred and fifty pounds of milk per ton, you would pay for all of your seed cost that went into the season to grow that corn for from, silage from the extra production that you got. Fifty pounds of milk per ton. Now, what we're going to have this year, you know, we go up to. We go up to World Dairy Expo at Madison, Wisconsin every year. You and I are up there for, yeah. for pretty much the whole week and visiting with folks and having meetings and doing doing a lot of fun stuff. They're, they're, they have a they have a um, competition up there, mm-hmm. Forage Super Bowl, right? That that we right. always that we always uh, uh, get a chance to see how our corn silage stacks up against others because our producers turn in the corn that they that they raise from us and they compete for the awards at the at the Super Bowl. At the Super Bowl, we're going to have standard corn silage up there that's going to come in probably in the neighborhood of 3,900 pounds of milk per ton yeah. this year, 3,800 pounds of milk per ton last year. If the average is 3,200, and if 50 pounds of milk per ton pays for your seed cost, and, and you move from, and you're an average producer at 3,200 pounds of milk per ton, and you move to 38 or 3,900 oh, pounds yeah. of milk per ton, you're now bringing in enough money to... to, to to pay for 30%, 40% of the land that it's on. Yeah. And you know, that sounds absurd, but it's a fact. It's just math. It's simple math. Now, you got to hold your yield. Yes, yes. You can't come in at thirty eight or 900 pounds of milk per ton and suffer yield loss right. because now you've got to balance whether or not the amount of feed that you're going to have to, gonna you're gonna have to buy off the right. farm is going to be able to compensate right. for the milk per ton you know, that you've gained coming off of that. So I'm, that's why I come back and I say, we've got to yield, and yet we've got to stretch for that 3,900 pounds of milk per ton. Guess what? We are going to have corn silage up there this year in the standard corn division. And, and I apologize for tooting our horn, okay? Yeah. But because this is basic conversation, but but we'll have corn silage up there that comes in 3,900 pounds of milk per ton, as well as the BMRs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how many years have we had a higher milk per ton on our uh, on our milk, results yeah. than the highest yeah. BMR sample? Our, our averages will, will sometimes have, have oftentimes been the master's choice average has oftentimes been higher than the BMR average. So, dude, there 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 comes a point where you have to be able to to teach the management that goes into there to raise healthy corn plants that are going to have the opportunity to produce that kind of milk per ton. Yes. Now, we're, we're talking to livestock people. If we've got people out there that are listening that are livestock people, and we generally do, we, we know that you know our feedback that we've got a lot of, lot of dairy producers that listen to our podcast, they know that if we get a, a calf or a pig or whatever animal off to a great start and feed them through, that they've got a, a much more successful, much more efficiently, much more you know, uh, a profitable animal. Right. But are they giving the same credit to the crops in the field if well, they don't get that but, corn crop but off to the same that, start? But not only that, not only that, think think about it this way and and you know, the 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 cow guys, the livestock guys, man, they will pour over a genetics book. Man, they're they're going to pour over a genetics book. Absolutely. And man, and we're going to pick the right semen and we're going to pick the right cows and we're going to pour over this so that we've got the best genetics in our herd possible. And then they just they just they just plant whatever crappy corn that gets. Give me give me that hundred and five day hybrid. Give me that hundred and five yeah. day hybrid. I Looks don't, good. I don't, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and don't even think about that. And yeah. so starting with with some of those some of those um, superior genetics that have been selected and bred uh, for for high quality forage, and then and then going into the management, you know. And, and and I think it's I think there's a lot of similarities there. You know, the 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 cow guys start with good genetics, and they and then they continue with good management and herd health and um, and cow comfort and all of those things because that they know that that's going to make a difference in milk production. And then they just buy the neighbor's corn that he didn't that that he's going to just chop for silage and don't even know what it is. Not only do they buy the neighbor's corn, but they don't. But but we don't have people out here that are trained to help folks with the management of how to get to that level of 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 high quality and right. high yield. Yeah, and and you know 
we're going to have this year. We're going to have a hundred folks in here here at the end of this month, actually, for training on on a system we call MC Complete System. That's going to guide folks to help them with the management. That's going to go into making that kind of silage. How high do you chop? Yep. How how what what planting pops do you plant? You know, it's more than just sele- you 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 mentioned selecting a. Uh, uh, the correct hybrid for the right location and, and, and the right soil type. Yeah, I mean, well, that that's that's important. But how how thick you plant how, that corn, the yep. population that you get, gonna is going to affect the, the 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 health of that plant. You you had some really interesting. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, um, research that you've done in that regard for the last several years, you've planted at several different several pops. different several different populations, and and just and looking at how yeah I can in, I can most of the time I can increase yield by increasing population, but when I increase population, okay, and, and the the higher my planting population gets, the lower the quality gets, mm-hmm. the lower the quality gets, um, and. And and it and yield is not not that much different. Yes, I can increase yield by planting higher populations, but my but my quality decreases at a rate that doesn't keep up with the with the amount of yield, right? Exactly. And and so I just uh, I think that sometimes guys just you know they they just they get stuck in a rut. You know, why do you plant at the population that you plant at? Well, that's where my planters planted. You know, that's the way. I, that's the population I've always planted. Well, what if we changed it a little bit? Mm-hmm. What if we did that? So there's a couple other things here. How did we get so far away from the? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's your fault. Boy, you and sure. I get to talk, and it's. it's I, I know. I know. So so there's a couple other things here. You know, we talked about cow numbers being up. This is one one thing that it, that was, that I thought was really interesting is that Michigan has been up for the last 14 years. Yeah. They they've increased cows the 14 years and 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 we were talking because they are last year they were number 2 in milk per cow. Okay? So they they had a Michigan had an average of 25,000 almost 26,000 pounds of milk per cow. All right? And and then we were so you thought, well maybe that's what what was your what was your suspicion there? I I was I'm assuming and 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 I and and I don't know how well you agree with this. I'm assuming that it was Larger farms that were that were intensely managed. Well, would you believe that Michigan did not make the um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Did not make the top ten for uh, states for cows per herd. No, I wouldn't have believed I, that. I mo- most cows per herd. Number one was New Mexico, and Michigan didn't even didn't even make the list. Hmm. I, yeah, which really kind of surprised me. So I don't know. I don't know what the boys in Michigan are doing. You know, maybe they're maybe they're listening to to Mike Allen. You know, Doctor Doctor Mike Allen, and 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 getting some high quality forages and 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 those kinds of things up there. But but I was I was with you. I would have thought it would have been maybe larger farms that were um, that were kind of moving in and um, and and more intensely managed. But as as far as I, I didn't even make the top ten there. So, you know, and, but of those top 10, when you get, when you get there for the milk, so you have most milk per cow, right? Mm -hmm. And, and then you have most cows per herd. So that would, that would show you the, where the, where the biggest herds are. Um, You know, there are several, several of, of the top 10 cows per herd. And this is on page four there is that didn't even, didn't even make the, the, the most milk. Um, New Mexico, Washington, Washington State uh, had uh, had an average of uh, twenty four thousand pounds of milk per cow. Didn't make the top ten. New York, twenty three, almost twenty four uh, thousand pounds for milk. Didn't make the top ten. Wisconsin, twenty uh, twenty three five hundred uh, pounds, uh, you know, average for cow. Uh, didn't didn't make the top ten. And even Nebraska. Nebraska, which I would have thought would have been maybe a, a, a big a big herd state, uh, as far as you know the average size of the herd, uh, was kind of kind of interesting to me. Uh, didn't uh, didn't do that. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so you know something going on there, in Michigan. Maybe they're maybe they're looking at higher quality forages uh, as they are. Uh, they've got, but they're gaining cows and they're and they're doing a they're doing a good job up there. Um, so as we as we kind of kind of shift here, I, th- I think that we've we there's some there's some things there. Uh, I I don't mind I don't mind tooting our own horn. You you do you mind me tooting our horn? Uh, you know 
uh, what I thought was uh, pretty interesting is that of the the people who responded to this survey, eight point eight percent of them said they planted Master's Choice. Oh, I saw that. Uh, which which maybe doesn't sound like a whole lot, uh, but for for us, I think is a big deal. And what's even a bigger deal is that of the respondents there, and I'm I'm going to look down here so that I make sure that I get the numbers correct. Okay, and like I say, I'll give I'll give credit where credit is due. I think it's page 20, 18, 19. Yep, page 20. Page 20 is where it is. Um, so so uh, 1,100 people responded to this question that asked them, what brand of corn did you plant? 22% of them said, said Pioneer. Mm-hmm. 12% said DeKalb. So there was a pretty big gap there. I was I was surprised at that, at that gap. Um, and then nine percent, nine point four percent said mycogen, and uh, eight point eight percent said master's choice. Uh, so next closest uh, competitor was at four percent. Was it four percent? Yeah. There's one, two, three of those, and then several at uh, three and three percent and less. And it's interesting. It is. It is interesting. And. And so, you know, Master's Makes Choice... Makes us feel good. There's some big names. Uh, absolutely. Lot absolutely. Number four on the list there. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's that's really, really awesome. And so I uh, thought that that was, that was pretty good that, um, you know, our uh, our marketing guys are, are doing a good job getting it out. Our sales guys are, are doing a good job getting on the farms. And, and our dealers are doing a great job servicing that and, and helping people understand the, the advantages of Master's Choice. So that kind of leads me into this. I, I, I kind of I did this on, on purpose. So we're, we're kind of wrapping up sales season. You know, I mean, you know, this is kind of the end of our end of our year in, in a sense, you know, uh, no more corns being planted. We've basically sold all we're going to sell for this year. Um, how, how did, how did, as, as, as president owner of master choice, you know, how, how did, how did we end up this year? How, how did, how did, how did things go for, for master choice? Good year. We had a good year. We had a, we had a, we had a decent game. Um, uh, if if you let me, I'll kind of I'll kind of back up a little bit and give you a little give you a little history. I mean, uh, Paul and I have owned the business uh, since November of two thousand and five, <clears throat> and November two thousand five, we were just moving, you know, two or three thousand units of corn, and um, which which was n- nothing, and the business has grown substantially. I mean, you give credit where credit's due. God has absolutely blessed our our That's business right. in terms of of growth and resources and 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 influence uh, to the point where you know now we're 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 you know in in a name being recognized with pioneer with decal mycogen yep. and uh, you know to be perfectly honest with you you know this as well as I do they are all taking shots at us yes uh, so you know we're we're apparently annoying them uh, uh, considerably which is which is a which is a ultimate compliment we we started the business and and Paula did everything. She, she arranged for all the shipping. She did all of the marketing. She did all of the billing. She did everything. It was it was she and I, and then we added a, a staff member and another one. But we we could just about we could just about earn enough money to grow to almost to almost double the size each year that we did. We we put every dollar that we could scrape together from the business back into growing more corn. And so we grew the business as fast as we could. And, you know, we, we, we couldn't grow it as fast as the demand was for our corn. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel comfortable going and borrowing a lot of money against the business to, to push there. And maybe, Mark, that was a mistake. Um, but I wanted to be able to lay my head down at night and rest and know that, I'd, that I wasn't at risk for the business, and in particular, I wasn't at risk for our customers that right. were depending on us, and we wasn't at risk for our employees who were depending on their livelihood mm-hmm. being here, and I didn't want some type of a catastrophe and us being leveraged to the point where we could lose the business. So enough of that talk. Right. But we were growing, the, the, the bottom line is we grew the business just as fast as we possibly could by throwing every dollar back into more production. We upset people that we would run out of corn. So for the first six or seven years that Paul and I owned the business, we ran out of corn every year. We yep. were scraping the inventory, you know, the, the warehouses to get all the corn out that we could possibly get out. 
And then as we continued to grow, and, and, and back in those days, when you had, when you, you know, you'd have 100% growth a lot of years. Right. You know, you doubled mm-hmm. in size in those early years. And then it got to where you double, you know, increase 70% and 50% and then 30% and then 20%. And now we're growing, you know, in that 10 plus percent right. every year um, for the last couple of years. So we had a nice, we had a nice growth. The thing that we have, that we have done that I'm most pleased with is that we have we have branded ourselves as the leaders in livestock nutrition and that we are dedicated to changing this mindset that's out there that that corn is corn and we can create this big pile of commodity corn and we can use it for this purpose for that purpose for the other purpose you know so we drag off of this big pile of corn for a dairy cow and for a, and for a pig and for chicken and for ethanol and for export and for everything yeah and for the most part, that corn that's been that's been out there in the marketplace has been this very hard, high test weight corn that doesn't feed well in livestock. And we've been out there saying, "This is the case. Look at this. You yep. know, pay attention to this." And and so I think that we've been. If if there's one thing that that I am so proud of our our business and our staff for being able to do is to promote that message that we are creating livestock feed for livestock producers specifically right. designed and bred and developed for them for this purpose. And so we had to fight our way through that for the last number of years to the point where now all of these major names that you're just mentioning are beginning to come out that, that said, no, there is no difference in these corns. Yeah, it's just, now saying, it's just when you no, harvest it or moisture yep. content, you've, you've heard all of that from yep. the experts from those right. other companies, right. which is not true. Genetics make a difference. Genetics well, do it, make a difference. It's not that moisture time, yeah, yeah, okay, time doesn't yeah, make a difference. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's, it's genetics and management, not just management. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. And so, now we are now they are coming out and they're saying, "Oh, hey, guess what? We've discovered, you know, that that these things yeah. make a difference, Absolutely. and and we've now got a hybrid that makes a difference." And and so, um, I, you know, some people think, you know, doesn't that kind of irritate you? That no, we that's the biggest compliment that we could be paid. You Absolutely. know, that that we've been out there and we've we we've helped to change an industry that that's going to make it more productive and. You know, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to be tooting our horn. That's not what I want no. to say. But that's satisfying. It's gratifying. It, 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 it is satisfying and gratifying to know that to know that we, um, you know, we, we are changing the industry. That that we here at Master's Choice are 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 part of changing the industry to where corn is no longer just corn, and and changing the mindset of of people and. And and when and when the bigs, we'll just say it that way, when the bigs notice that, you you know that you know that you've changed you you've you've done your job well. So yeah. Lynn, appreciate you being in today. Appreciate you sitting My down. Pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Always a good time. Always a good time. I hey, think we could absolutely do another podcast with the material <laughs> with that's just in the this material. Thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so uh so guys, I appreciate you all listening in today. Uh thanks for your your uh feedback at times, your comments, your emails. All of those things. Hey, remember that we are social. Catch us on on YouTube and Instagram. And always you can find us at seedcorn.com on the website. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.